Hello, and welcome to Unabridged, the weekly podcast where teachers take on books. This is Sarah. Join us for bookish episodes and a monthly book club pick. This is Ashley. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod, or go to our website, unabridgedpod.com, where the books we read are linked for purchase. This is Jen. Check out our Teachers Pay Teachers store, our Patreon page, and our newsletter. Please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts to support us. You want opinions about books? We've got them. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Unabridged. This is episode 176. This is a book club club episode. We are focusing on Ocean Vuong's On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. Before we get started, I just want to let you all know that if you have not checked out our social media presence, we've got some stuff going on, mainly on Instagram and on Facebook. So in both of those, we have communities where we keep you updated on our most recent episodes and on what we're reading. In both, we have communities where we talk about our Unabridged Podcast Reading Challenge for 2021. So you can get ideas there for things that might help you meet those categories. On Instagram, we also have buddy read chats every month and book club chats every month that give you a chance to talk more in depth about some of the books we're reading. And we are constantly doing updates of what we have going on for the podcast, both episode wise and otherwise. And then every Saturday, you can tell us what you're reading. And we share that with other readers just to give everybody a sense of what's going on in the unabridged community. So on Instagram, we are at unabridged pod. And on Facebook, you can find us at that address as well. Facebook's always a little more complicated. But yeah, we have that link on our website. And you should be able to search and find us there. So we'd love for you to join our social media community. All right. So to start our episode today, we're going to do our bookish check-in and each share a book we're currently reading. Ashley, what are you reading? So I was saying to Jen and Sarah before we start recording that I have been so good in 2021 about not starting a million books at once. But... I made it all the way to almost May. We're recording a little before May starts and made it through without doing that. But we had some (laughs) family travel and things during April. And alas, I have started like 10 books. So here we are again. Anyway, I started one late last night and I'm excited to read it. And it's Beth O'Leary's The Flat Share. I have shared before on here about Beth O'Leary's The Switch, which I absolutely loved. I talked about it on our favorite tropes episode because I loved the trope of the switching lives. And so I was excited to get back to her work. I just really loved the way she developed the characters. And I talked before with The Switch about how I particularly enjoyed the relationship with the grandmother and the granddaughter. So, you know, a 20 somethings person and then like a 70s or 80s something person and what those two lives looked like. So I'll be interested to read something else by her because that was the part that really worked for me. And so I'm interested to see, you know, if the characters are different, how that will affect my experience. But I've heard great things about the flat share and I just wanted to get started. So one of the things I love about her work is that it grabs you right away. It's really easy to access her stories. And so, like I said last night, it was late and I had already done a lot of other things, a lot of other things on my to-do list. And yet that was a great one to start because I felt immediately attached to the story. So you have Tiffy who lives in London and she is, it opens with her and two friends of hers looking at at a flat and she's trying to find a place to live cost of living, of course, in London is astronomically high. And so she's trying to find something and the place is horrific. There's mold everywhere. There's like mushrooms growing inside. There's, it's just disgusting. And her friends are like, you can not do this. And she is thinking maybe I can, because as she says in the very beginning, desperation causes lots of things to look more desirable than you would think. And yet she's trying to find another solution because this doesn't look particularly safe and is really all she can afford. And so you find out that she had been dating a very wealthy guy for a long time and she's still living in his flat, Mm -hmm. And but he's hardly ever there. And so she has kind of just stayed on while he (laughs) travels and does things. And 
that's not great for a lot of reasons, but her friends are kind of wondering why she's suddenly feeling that she's got to leave. And it comes to light that he had come home to the, uh, to the place with his new girlfriend, his current girlfriend. And then she, Tiffany kind of says, we need some ground rules. And he's like, this is my place and you stay <laughs> here for free. So no, there aren't going to be any ground rules laid by you. And maybe you need to back pay for the last several months that you've been living here <laughs> and you will be paying, you know, X amount in the future. So that is what put the fire under her <laughs> rear to, to get herself together and get out of that apartment. And so we, we come to find that that's what's going on. Well, there is a flat share opportunity that's been posted by someone and the basic thing is that the person is a nurse and works the night shift. So the idea is that there could be somebody there, you know, at night, and then they could share the apartment and the bed, but one would be there at night and one would be there during the day. <laughs> and it's only like 350 pounds. So this is affordable for her, but her friends are like, this is not a great idea for somewhat <laughs> obvious reasons. But... And it's, it's also unclear whether the person is male or female because they just posted the initial L. So we get our next chapter and it's Leon, who is a night nurse. And he is kind of rationalizing why he's willing to come up with this crazy arrangement. And he does have a girlfriend who he has not told that he is going to have this setup with. Oh, no. And so he is justifying to himself why it's okay to do this. And how he's never even going to see the person and he's going to magically have 350 more pounds every month. And so this is going to be a great plan. So that's kind of where I am. And <laughs> I, I love the premise. And again, I just think her work is so inviting and fun and interesting and also looks at a lot of things about the way life works and city living and that kind of thing that I think are really cool. So again, that's Beth O'Leary's The Flat Share. And it just started, but I will report back at another time. So far, so good. <laughs> oh, that sounds so good. I really, yeah, I have got to get into Beth O'Leary's work. I still have not read The Switch either. <laughs> and I know both of you loved it. So I've just got to prioritize. Yeah, the flat share is high on my TBR because I, I have the uh, I actually have the audiobook and the kin my K Kindle edition, so I really want to read that too. I love her work. The Switch was one of my favorite reads of last year, I think. Okay. Yeah, so good. All right, Sarah, what are you reading? I am reading. I'm almost done with Lakin Zaya Kemp's Somewhere Between Bitter and Sweet. This is a brand new YA book and it is told in alternating perspectives between Penn, who she is an aspiring baker, her father and brother, and her run this family restaurant and something happens and her dad fires her from the restaurant. And so then that's kind of about her finding her way apart from her family. The other perspective is Xander. Xander is an undocumented teenager. He works at the restaurant. He gets hired at the restaurant. And what you come to find out is that Penn's dad has a soft spot for people who are struggling or need work. And he kind of takes in everybody in the community. And he is like this beacon of hope in their small community. And the book is just about Penn kind of finding her way apart from her dad and about Xander. Of course, there's a little bit of a love story. Um, it's a YA novel, um, but it's just really, it's very accessible, but it's also talks about some really complex issues, like what it means to be undocumented in America, what it means to have brown skin in America and have to, you know, they deal with cop stops and different things that just being treated unfairly. And I think for, especially for YA readers, it is really accessible. The story moves really quickly, but it, it really sheds a light on a lot of things that, are, that happen in communities that some kids may not even realize happens. And another thing is like, 
people being taken advantage of when they are having hard times, being taken advantage of by people who do not have their best interests at heart and how it's so hard to get out from under that. And it's just really, really well written. The characters are just, you grow to love them throughout the book. And then if you listen to the podcast, you know, I love books that have anything that centers around food. So Penn is this amazing cook and baker. She tweaks the menu items at her dad's restaurant, but she also has this aspiration to be this baker. So there's all these really lovely descriptions of food. And I just, I think it is excellent. It's one of the best YA books I have read in a while because I think it's very well-rounded and the story is just so compelling and the characters are just, you just love them so much. So I highly recommend it. I only have a few more chapters left and I have just enjoyed it so much. And the audio is absolutely fantastic. The narrators, it's two narrators. So there's a female and a male narrator, which I like that. And it's just really great. So that is Lake and Isaiah Kemp's Somewhere Between Bitter and Sweet. I absolutely love that one too, Sarah. I, I agree with everything you said. I got it as an ALC from Libro FM and picked it on a whim one day. And it was one of those, I just could not stop listening. I kind of wanted to stop everything else and just listen to that book. Same. And I downloaded it right before we started recording <laughs> so, so that I could listen soon because it sounds fantastic. It's great. Jen, what are you reading? So I am reading Glendy Vandera's The Light Through the Leaves. I am doing this as kind of a side buddy read with read with Tony on Instagram. I, we read Vandera's previous book where the forest meets the stars and really loved it. And this actually popped up as one of the Amazon first reads that are free each month. And I immediately downloaded it. And Tony got on our previous chat and said, who wants to read this one with me? And let me tell you, this book is another one. I started and could not put it down. Let me just describe the first chapter and then I will tell you one thing. So this book is about Ellis Abbey, who is a new mom. She has a baby daughter named Viola. She also has three-year-old twins, Jasper and River. And when the book opens, she has gone into the woods because that is a place that she finds a lot of comfort. She's taken her kids there. She just was out and about at lunchtime and saw her husband kissing another woman. And to find some comfort, to clear her head, she takes her kids to the woods. She tells the boys that they're going to get tadpoles at the river. And she's just trying to keep them busy while she processes what she just saw. So she takes the kids back to their van. And one of the boys dumps his tadpoles all over the van. And so she sets Viola down for a second to help him get the tadpoles back up. And the boys are just having total and complete meltdowns. So she's ready to get them home and to confront her husband. And she gets in the van and is a minute down the road when she realizes that she didn't put her daughter back in the van. I just have so, to say, I'm having anxiety just like listening to this description. Yeah. So I this was is, this too. Is, oh my gosh. Yeah. My it is. Hurts horrifying. And also as moms, we all know how easy it is to get distracted. And so I will also say this is the second book I read in a row where someone is kidnapped. So I, oh, no. I was reading the first chapter and thinking, I do not know if I can read this book because when she goes back to get Viola, Viola is gone. She, there's, oh she, there's just no sight of her. It's like she was never there at all. Fortunately, it's weird to say, but the book moves on very quickly. It is very much about recovery from what is happening. And Ellis is married to a very wealthy man who is the son of a senator. And they do not want, they want this situation to be managed. And so they start to give Ellis pills to basically keep her sedated. And she very much blames herself and has a lot of guilt so she starts drinking on top of the pills and eventually her husband says, th this is all very early. So I know it sounds very spoilery, but it ha all happens right up front. Eventually her husband says, I can't be with you anymore. We need to get a divorce. And she's like, no kidding. And then she finally tells him what she saw that day and says, it's partly your fault that all of this happened because this is what I saw. And she just leaves. She leaves her kids and does and leaves her husband's. And 
because she says that she cannot continue to be their mom because she realizes that she has this addiction. She grew up as the child of an addicted mother and was very, very traumatized and feels that her staying would actually be worse than if she leaves. So it is just this heartbreaking premise. I feel I really want to share one other thing, but I feel like anything after this would be very, very spoilery. So I will just say it is an amazing book. It is an empathetic book. It deals with some people who are going through some very difficult things in the most empathetic way possible. It is heart wrenching as a mom. Yeah, that first chapter, I had to put the book down for a minute. But then of course, I wanted to know what happened next. So I I cannot recommend it enough. I cannot wait to talk about this book and this buddy read because there are some things that happen that are gigantic twists and turns. So that is Glendy Vandera's The Light Through the Leaves. I know it sounds like a book that would be hard to pick up, but trust me when I say that it is, it is worth the read. I cannot wait to see how it ends. So. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Sarah and I are covering everything here. I feel like I just traumatized them. (laughs) <laughs> there, there's a silence because Sarah and I are unsure how, where to go with that. No, actually, uh, it's funny because right before we recorded, we were all talking about things that we're sensitive to in books and how we manage that. And sometimes for me, a situation like the one that Jen just described, I am okay to read, but I do want to know going yeah, in. Yeah. I want to know both that it's going to happen and what the resolution is. And even if in that situation where she doesn't get her back, she's not there when she returns, I'm still comforted by knowing what that outcome is. And for me as a reader, I've had to learn that, that sometimes I need to know. For example, I read a book recently and wanted to know whether the character was going to be okay. So I flipped later in the book just to make sure the character's name was still in the book. And that was comforting for me to know that the character was going to make it through. And so sometimes I think that all of us as readers have to know those things. So, I mean, it sounds phenomenal and I would consider, I would consider reading it given your recommendation, but I do find some comfort, I think, in knowing, especially if it's the premise of a book, Mm -hmm. what that premise is so that I can navigate my way through it and then see what happens. So, yeah. Well, and when we are done recording, there's one thing that I will tell you that I think will help, but I don't want to say it on the air because it is (laughs) a major spoiler. So, Good to know. All right. It does sound like a good one. It's really good. It is really good. I This is only her second novel and I will be reading. She will become an autobi author for me because both of them are so, so compelling. And she also, so she is a biologist and she has just these amazing descriptions of nature and of science. In the previous book, the main character studied birds. And so she was in the woods a lot. And it talked a lot about just the scientific part of what she did and the observations. And this one, because the woods are such a central part, the forest is such a central part of the way Ellis deals with problems. That is a presence through the novel, which I just love as well. So it's really good. All right. Well, we are going to shift gears in a major way to talk about our book club pick, Ocean Vuong's On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. I'll read a brief summary and then we will dig in. So this is a lyrical epistolary novel written by Little Dog to his mother, who is an immigrant from Vietnam. At the book center are three real relationships. The mother-son relationship, which veers wildly from love to abuse. Little Dog's relationship with his grandmother, Lon, a refuge from his tempestuous feelings for his mother, and a tragic romance with Trevor. As Little Dog shares his story in this letter to his mother, he considers the nature of identity, of love, and of memory. All right, we're going to talk overall impressions first. Sarah, what did you think of this one? I will say this one was a hard one for me because it is clear that Ocean Vuong is a poet and his writing is beautiful. But I did think that the narrative had a lot of poetic structure to it, which made it hard for me at times to follow because the timeline wildly fluctuates. As a reader, I can recognize that this is beautiful writing. And I mean, this, the heart of the story is just tragic and so like heart-wrenching. Uh, But it was a little bit hard for me to get through. I did recognize that this is beautiful writing and that Ocean Vuong is clearly a really talented artist. And I thought a lot of the metaphors were just beautiful and very, 
I mean, gut wrenching. Like I, every time I think about this book, I just think it's gut wrenching because there's just a lot of tragedy and a lot of really difficult situations. And I thought that the impact of the book after I was finished was significant. But it was a hard book for me to get through and it was a hard book for me to follow at times. And I read a lot, but the timeline would kind of knock me off pace at times. But again, Ocean Vuong is very talented and the writing is beautiful. It just was a little bit more difficult than some of the other book club picks we've had lately. Yeah. Yeah. Ashley, what did you think? I was so moved by the passages within the book. In the beginning, I felt like I was highlighting every paragraph. I mean, I think the writing is stunning and I absolutely loved that part, but I agree with the challenge of connecting to what was happening at times. And also there were some parts that I felt that there was such a beautiful metaphor being made, but sometimes I didn't always connect to what the metaphor was. Like it was like for me as the reader, there were times that I knew I wasn't grasping everything that that was being said. And I think that's okay. I think this is a book that would definitely hold up for a reread and that I could dig deeper with a reread of it. But there were times that I was a little bit lost, but for sure. So for me, the beginning was really hard. And that was a lot because of the way that the violence, every single memory that the narrator has in the beginning is punctuated by violence mm -hmm. and it's violence from his mother and that is heart-wrenching and so that part was really hard for me and, I, and effective i mean i think that was purposeful and yet i found it so painful but when he connected with trevor and began to find albeit a very complicated relationship mm -hmm. he began to find a relationship where he had some equal ground and did connect in a meaningful way. From that point on, I, everything moved a lot better for me and I felt a lot more connected. So I think this was a good example of a book that for me was challenging to access in the beginning, but I was really glad I stayed the course because I think it's really beautiful. And after that initial part, it really picked up for me and moved a lot more smoothly. And I felt a lot more grounded in what was happening because like Sarah said, I think it takes us a while to get a sense of the timeline and the things that are happening. But once I got there, I felt more grounded. And then I also came to see his mother in a much more empathetic light. And I think that was really effective as well. That that opening part, she is so violent and it is so painful to see such a young child being abused. And yet that's contextualized as the story unfolds in a really beautiful and powerful way. And it just shows the generational trauma that happens and how impactful that is on each person. And so I just think, and I mean, I loved Jen's description of Lon as a refuge from his mother. And I think we see that too, of his relationship with his grandmother and how much comfort he finds in that. So I just really appreciated the way that the story unfolded and felt that putting it all together in that way shows how complicated things are, but also how relationships can be really beautiful, even when they're complex. What about you, Jen? What was your overall impression? Yeah, so I really love this one. I initially read it in print back in 2019, and I reread it for this episode. And this time I listened to the audio, which for me always makes a huge difference in the way I, I just process a book. So that was really interesting. Vuong actually reads the audio himself. And I feel as if he really emphasized those poetic parts of it. When I remembered back, the part that stood out to me most was his relationship with Trevor. And I remember that the writing was beautiful, but I was really focused on their relationship. So then to listen and to hear, of course, I recognize that the writing was beautiful, but to hear it emphasize that for me even more. It also really emphasized for me the fact that this book is so much about memory and the way we remember things and how we remember things, which I think contributes to that kind of fragmented nature of the timeline, because I think that's, it's almost free association that he, this happened and then this happened. And because they were similar experiences, he's going to tell them back to back, even though they were years apart. And so I thought that was emphasized as well by the audio. So I really love this book. I, I do think it's weird to say that I loved it because parts of it, so much of it is so tragic and so heartbreaking and 
I just feel that each of those relationships has some bright spots, but also is kind of framed by tragedy. So it feels strange to say I loved it, but I also think he has such an ability to think about what was beautiful in each of those relationships also, and to have such empathy for people who really hurt him sometimes through carelessness and sometimes an intentional way, but he was able to say that each of these relationships was meaningful. So I, yeah, I'm still processing clearly, which is strange to say about a book that I've read twice, but in some ways I feel like I'm processing more this time than I was the first time. Yeah. I think there's a lot to process in there. And I think with the tragedy, it's so vivid. The yeah. things are, there are so many scenes and some of them are just really painful and also super vivid. And so I think that really has an impact. It's weird. I feel like I'm having to continually remind myself that this is not a memoir yes. because it reads so you're so connected to little dog and he's using, he's talking to his mother and in a letter to her. And so I'm having, I don't know why I'm having to continually remind myself, but it does feel as if you're walking through his life with him. And I mm -hmm. think that's really impactful. Yeah, I felt like that even more this time. The audio, I guess because I listened to so many memoirs on audio, the audio made that feel even stronger that I had to keep reminding myself that this is not him. And the author reading it too, sometimes that impacts me as well. But it is, part of it is the point of view that's used, I think, makes it feel more personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. All right, so now we're going to move to what worked for us. Ashley, what worked for you? So I think one of the things I absolutely loved was the exploration of masculinity and how that connects to relationships. And that part I thought was so masterfully done. The way that Trevor struggles to understand himself and accept himself and the ways that he can't and the ways that he can. And I thought all of that was just beautiful and how little dog I think in some ways, Little Dog is more accepting of himself than Trevor is. Mm -hmm. And yet, because he's not as embedded in the toxic masculinity of the American culture as portrayed through Trevor and his father, you know, it's women who have been in his life. He's very connected to his mom and his grandmother. And even though his culture is not accepting of homosexuality, he still is seems more comfortable in his skin than Trevor is. Mm -hmm. And yet both of them are just navigating these parts of themselves that I think are really powerful. I was deeply moved by the film Brokeback Mountain mm. when I saw that. And I thought of that movie so many times throughout this because I think that the character that Heath Ledger plays in that movie struggles in the same way of not wanting to be who he is and thinking that he's going to grow out of it or it's mm -hmm. a phase or it's just this one time instead of understanding and accepting himself and his sexuality and his identity. And we see that with Trevor, and yet he has these moments of profound tenderness. I thought that that part where they go in the river and he washes off little dog and comforts him and shows how good he sees him to be, I just thought was really beautiful. And so I think that was the thing that that was something that worked really well for me in the book was just that Trevor was such a profoundly complicated person. And we see the role of drugs in this. I thought a lot of dope sick of Beth Macy's dope sick when I was reading and the way that unbeknownst to the people who are given the prescriptions, they are in a lot of ways signed on to a death sentence. And we can see that little dog is only spared that death sentence because of his fear of needles. And that he knows that about himself, that the only reason he's not exactly in the same situation as Trevor at constant risk of overdose is because of his fear of the needles that kept him from getting into some of what Trevor was doing. But all of that was just really, really rich. So that was one of the things that worked really well for me. I feel a little sad not to explore his relationship with his mom and his grandmother, because I think that's another just really well done part. But in general, I loved the exploration of relationships in all of their complexity and in all of their shades of 
of color, some of which are really awful and some of which are really beautiful. I loved that in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sarah, how about you? What worked for you? I'm going to go toward the mother and grandmother route, but I really like the way that memories were explored and how even the little, all these horrific things were happening to little dog, especially in that fr the front half of the book. It was almost like he was able to process the memories that Lon told him about her life and then about his mom, like Rose's life and about how all of these things that happened to them and these really difficult things kind of formed them into the people that they were, which gave Little Dog kind of this grown up understanding of why his life was the way that it was, it, even though it wasn't right he was almost able to, he was just so wanting to please these two women in his life. I just thought all that was really powerful, tragic, and really hard to read. But I really liked the way that Vuong explored the way that memories and the way that things happen to us, especially traumatic things happen to us early in life that they play out for years and generations almost to come. And I thought that was all really powerful. How about you, Jen? What worked for you? Both of you said things that I absolutely agree with. I agree that those things work for me as well. So when I thought back on the book, I said that I remember Trevor most, and then definitely I remembered his mother. And I wish I had remembered Lon more because I thought their relationship was so beautiful. And I thought, you know, often when we're kids, we think our parents are perfect. And then we learn about their humanity and their imperfections. And I thought with Little Dog, it was almost the opposite. His youthful understanding of his mother was so much about the abuse and that unpredictable violence. And as he got older, he came to understand her love for him more. And I thought Lon was such an important part of that in revealing these layers of his mother's story and of her story and in the ways his mother had to struggle to understand who she was and that that was such an essential part of Little Dog understanding himself. And I think even that name, we keep saying Little Dog, and that reveal, it, I think, is really important in the book that Little Dog feels like such a diminishing name, but it's because they wanted to protect him. And by calling him Little Dog, that would in some way protect him because it's kind of disguising his worth and his beauty. And I think that complexity, that nuance is on every page that there's no excusing the ways that his mother abuses him, but there is a lot of complexity and a lot of nuance behind that abuse. And I just think you see him wrestling with that in his letters to his mother that he knows she may never be able to read. And I think all of that is just really poignant and really, really beautiful. And I think everyone has to wrestle with these things, not to the extent that little dog is, but we all have to think about our pasts and our family's pasts and the way that impacts who we become. And we all have to move forward from that in some way and begin to take responsibility for ourselves. And I think that's a really important journey that we see him taking. So yeah, I, I love all of that. Yeah, I thought that with the unveiling of the connections to Lon and then how that helped him understand his mom, Rose, was just really beautiful. All right. Well, each of us now will share just one quotation, even though I'm sure we all marked <laughs> a lot of quotations in this book. Sarah, what's a quotation you'd like to share? So, yeah, this this book is full of beautiful quotations. The one that I chose is maybe one that isn't as lyrical in what it, in the actual words, but I thought it was the whole scene that this is comes after. I found that this was very poignant for me. So the quote is that night I promised myself I'd never be wordless when you needed me to speak for you. So began my career as our family's official interpreter. From then on, I would fill in our blanks, our silences, our stutters whenever I could. I code switched. I took off our language and wore my English like a mask so that others would see my face and therefore yours. And this came after this horrific scene where they're trying to order oxtail from the butcher and they don't have the word, the English word for it. And they are trying to mime what it is. And the people that are working 
at the butcher counter are horrible to them and just basically make fun. And that this is when little dog makes this decision that that's not going to happen anymore and that he is going to be that person for his mom. And I just think it just shows the love that he has for his mom and his grandmother. Again, kind of going back to what worked for me. It just, it was just this moment where he is taking on so much as this young child to stand up for his family and to be there for his family and to make his mom's life easier. Even a lot of times when she's making his life harder with the abuse and all of that. And he is just the love that he as a child has for these women. I just found that very impactful. So that's my quote. Ashley, what's a quotation you'd like to share? Yeah. So like we said, I mean, I just think that the writing is this such a strong part of this book. So it was hard to choose, but the one I chose is all freedom is relative. You know too well. And sometimes it's no freedom at all, but simply the cage widening far away from you. The bar is abstracted with distance, but still there as when they free wild animals into nature preserves only to contain them yet again by larger borders. But I took it anyway, the widening, because sometimes not seeing the bars is enough. And I chose that because I felt like it was one of the metaphors that came up a lot in the book where we look at the the veal with the calves and how they're put in the tiny cages and the times that he feels in cage. And certainly we see that for his mother and his grandmother and the ways that they are in, in cage by their lives. And so I loved that because I felt like this is just one example of where he sees the limitations, but is also looking for the beauty. And I think that that is just something that we see in the book so many times of, like I said about Trevor, I mean, that Trevor is encaged in a lot of ways by his circumstances, by his upbringing, by his culture and his understanding of the world. We see it for a little dog. And again, the generational trauma that has impacted his own life and the way that he's encaged by so many things because of that and because of a lot of other obstacles that he's navigating. But I just love that because I think that it shows how he is able to find beauty and acceptance in what he knows to be a limited freedom. So. Mm -hmm. When you were reading that, again, I think you hear the beauty of the language there. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, yeah, it's it's really gorgeous. Yeah. What about you, Jen? What did you choose? So I had a few selected. I'm going to go with this one. (laughs) All this time I told, they're laughing because I literally have three listed on the page. And I had more that I restrained myself from typing out. So all this time I told myself we were born from war, but I was wrong, Ma. We were born from beauty. Let no one mistake us for the fruit of violence, but that violence having passed through the fruit failed to spoil it. And I think, yeah, Ashley was alluding to this. I just think he is not trying to take away the tragedies that have been in his past. He is saying that in spite of those, there is beauty and there is worth. And it reminded me of that moment when he looks in the mirror and sees himself as beautiful And it's there in the title, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. He's not saying every moment of every day is beautiful and we always feel perfect, but he is saying we have to learn to watch for those moments and to celebrate those triumphs and to say we came through something really hard and we are still here. And I think that is an important declaration for him and one that is hard to make, but he works really hard to be able to say that we have emerged from this violence in our past and we are still beautiful. And I think that is amazing. So I love that. Yeah, that was one of my most favorite quotes as well. Just that, I mean, I absolutely love her. You know, he's just saying we are not the fruit of the violence. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so powerful. That actually reminded me of Chanel Miller's Know My Name Mm -hmm. and how she was like, this thing that happened does not define me. And so, yeah, I just think it's, a really powerful declaration and so beautiful, Mm -hmm. especially as we have moved through the book with him and seeing all the suffering. Right. Right. Yeah. And read this book because there will be a million more that you will want to mark and talk about yourself. So that's right. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, we are going to move on now to our pairings. Ashley, what book would you like to pair with this? 
So I shared before about how I had to keep reminding myself that this is not a memoir. I did pair it with a memoir and this is not my pairing, but I wanted to say that just this last month, we talked about Eric Gansworth's Apple Skin to the Core. And I think that is a great pairing for this as well. That one is a memoir in verse. So it is in poetry form more than this one, but I think there's just so many similarities. So if you enjoyed this, I think that one has a lot of really nice connections and would be a great read. But my pairing, my pick is Kiese Lehman's Heavy, an American memoir. I talked about this one when we shared our memoirs last summer that we have enjoyed and would recommend. And I found this to be such a powerful read. He does so many things in it, but the things that were that really connected to this are that he is writing to his mom. It is using the you form in addressing his mother. He also has a very complex relationship with his mom. There is abuse that comes from generational trauma that results in suffering for him. So there's just so many connections as far as the way that violence has shaped his life and also the exploration of being in America and what that means for him. He talks about being black, being homosexual, what that means in America, looking at the toxic culture that surrounds him and the ways that he is seen by the larger American culture. And so I just think there's a lot of similarities as far as the family connections and also the looking at so for little dog he's vietnamese american casey layman is talking about being black in america but there are certainly some connections as far as dominant white culture and the ways that that negatively impacts him and i said in the episode that I just absolutely loved it. It's not very long and yet there is so much in it. And so I stand by that. I think it's a phenomenal book and I also think it connects well in so many ways to this one. So again, that's KSA Layman's Heavy. Yeah, that's a great pairing. Sarah, what's your pairing? I'm pa- actually pairing and I actually think that Ashley talked about this book way back when it might already be in the vault. I don't know. <laughs> but this is a book that both Ashley and I read and loved. It's called Everything Here is Beautiful. It's by Mira T. Lee. And this story is about two Chinese American sisters. One is named Miranda and one is named Lucia. And the story is about their relationship. They have this really close re- but complicated relationship. Lucia struggles with mental health issues, and we didn't really talk a ton about it in our discussion of On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous, but there is some indication that Little Dog's mother struggles with some mental health issues, undiagnosed, and nothing and nothing really is done to help her with them, which is similar in Everything Here is Beautiful with this story about Miranda and Lucia. Lucia struggles with mental health issues and she she's on medication and off medication. And it's really a story about how her struggles impact her sister and the people that love her. And I just thought when I read Ocean Vuong's book, I really was thinking back to this book because it is a story about relationships in When Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous, it's mother, son, and in Everything Here is Beautiful, it's sisters. But it's similar in that they're very close, but it's so complicated. And I just thought it was a really good pairing. This book is longer and it is not as lyrical, but it is very well written. And it is a really, really compelling, beautiful story about the love between family and how when you struggle, there are people there that love you, but sometimes the love of someone is not enough to kind of climb above. And it's just a really, really great book. And I love it. And I think it pairs well with On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. So that is Mira T. Lee's Everything Here is Beautiful. That one is still on my list to read. I was looking at it on my bookshelf, Jen, so I can give it to you next time. Oh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah, I think that's a great pairing, Sarah. And I think one of the things I loved is how you see Lucia in a more and more empathetic light yes. the more that the book progresses, even though some of the things she does are really horrific. Right. They're tied to mental health issues, but they are, it's hard to overcome how bad the actions are for yes. some of the choices that she makes. But 
like this one, I think we come to see the full context as her sister comes to see the full context of what leads to her making those decisions. And then we understand it so much better. So I think, yeah, I, I absolutely love that book. It's gorgeous. I know it's just talking about, it makes me feel like I need to reread it because it just was so impactful. And I mean, the writing is beautiful and I just love that relationship between the sisters. Yeah. Jen, what is your pairing? So I chose a book that I think the mother-son relationship, again, is at its center. This is Lisa Coe's The Leavers. And this is about an immigrant from China. Her name is Polly. And she moves to America on her own and then eventually brings over her son, Deming. And then they have lived there for a little while. They are really struggling. She is really struggling to make enough money to support them effectively. And I will say that's another element of On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. We didn't talk about a lot. You see the work that his mother is trying to do is really harming her physically, that she has a lot of impact from that. And that is portrayed really well in the levers as well. But one day she just disappears and Deming has absolutely no idea where she has gone. They lived with Polly's boyfriend and his son. And for a while, Deming thinks he'll just be able to stay there. But then eventually they give him up for adoption and he's adopted by a white family. And it does alternate between perspectives. But what I thought about what made me think about the levers most, so I think there are a lot of parallels you could look at, but it is another book where we see that this is a relationship that has so, so much love at its center but it also has people making decisions that are really hurtful to the other person over and over again. And I think we see that in On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous in every single one of of Little Dog's relationships. Yet there were some moments with Trevor that I just thought were so hurtful that it just made me cringe and want to stop listening, stop reading for a moment. And that happens in Lisa Coe's The Leavers too. And yet there's always this return to this great love between a mother and her son. So I think that is a worthwhile pairing that in many ways would emphasize certain elements of this book that I think are important. Yeah, I have. I was shopping in my Kindle closet when I <laughs> when I chose the flat chair last night and I discovered I have that one on there. So I hope to read that soon because uh, I remember I think, you talking about it, Jen. Yeah, I think you'd really love it. It's. It's a great read, but again, just heartbreaking moments. So it's not an easy read, but I do think it's a powerful one. So, all right, well, we're going to end this book club discussion with our bookish hearts. Sarah, how many bookish hearts did you give this one? I'm going to give it four bookish hearts. It was a hard book for me to read, but I can recognize how beautiful it is. And I think that the story is a beautiful story. And I think he tells it very well. Ashley, how about you? Four bookish hearts for me. What about you, Jen? I'm giving it five. I think I gave it five the first time, and I think I appreciated more about it with the rereads. So yeah, I'm going to stick with five. All right. To end our episode today, we are going to do our Give Me One. And today's topic is one thing you like to do with your family. Sarah? So I'm going to be very selfish and say something that I like to do with my family, but I don't know if my family likes to do it. I just drag them to do it. But the question is one thing I like to do. So I love to go hiking. I I enjoy being in the mountains. We are very fortunate to be in the beautiful mountains around here and there's wonderful hikes. So I really enjoy being outside and doing that with my family. I did scar them once because I we asked about a hike that our kids could do and someone gave us wrong information that worked <laughs> at the park. And we went on a four and a half mile hike with little ones and there was an incline that was 750 feet in rocks. And so I scarred my children. So now they don't trust me <laughs> when I'm <laughs> asking them to take a hike. But I still, that is my, uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. I love that too. <laughs> Ashley, how about you? One of the things that I love to do with my family is travel. And if you've been following me on Instagram, you know we are less than 10 days when this comes out away from a big travel adventure. We are heading to Agadir in Morocco and we'll be there for three months. And then we're going to Madrid, Spain. And we've been... This has been in the works for a very long time, but was 
put on hold and has been kind of in limbo for quite a while, but we are going and uh, are excited to make that adventure. We love to travel, but like Sarah said about hiking, travel is that way too, that there's certainly a lot of tumult involved and you don't always know exactly what you're going to get, but we try to make sure we have a few high points that we can really cling to for the kids. And we do that leading up to going and find some things that we think they can be really excited about. And then when we travel, we try to make sure that we have those peak moments and that when we look back on it, that we really point those things out. And that really helps. I think it helps myself and I think it helps them too. So that's something I love. And if you're interested in keeping up with our adventures, we have an Instagram account. Nature and narration is what it's called. My life partner is me writing a book. And so that's where we got that title from. But so if you want to follow us, you can follow on that account and we'll be sharing pictures and, and stuff about our adventure. So what about you, Jen? So I am debating which thing to say. And I think I'm going to do the one that makes me sound horrible, but I'm just going to say it. So we like each night before the kids go to bed on a school night, we let them pick a show that we watch together. And I will say, if you have not watched Nailed It, that is on Netflix. And we eagerly look forward to each episode. And there was recently a new season where there were partners who were doing the Nailed It challenges. And we just love that show. It makes us laugh so hard. And yet it is in a good natured way. It's not that it, the, the baking is really, really bad. But everyone who signs up for the show knows that their baking is going to be really, really bad. And so it's more of this like everybody's just there supporting each other and laughing at each other and laughing with each other. And this has been one of our staples during quarantine and it has continued that yeah we just really love nailed it it's so funny if you have not watched it oh my goodness as someone who cannot bake i have a lot of empathy for these people and they'll roll out this amazing cake and they'll say okay you have an hour and a half to make this thing that i couldn't do you could give me a year and a half and i could <laughs> not create anything that looked like that cake and yeah so it's 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 a fun show. So I know that that makes me sound like the <laughs> inside introvert I am, but this is where I am. I try to do something more virtuous sounding, but sorry, <laughs> we watched Nailed It. <laughs> <laughs> that one sounds great, Jen. I haven't watched that. Oh my gosh, Ashley. I love the great British baking show. I'm sure that has come up on here before. And I love it because of that, because when people, it's just a good natured approach and so I like that. And whereas a lot of the other shows, I love to watch people cook, but a lot of them are that more cutthroat attitude yeah. and it's a lot more competitive and I don't appreciate that part. So I, I that sounds great. Oh <laughs> it's right gosh, up my Ashley. alley. You have got to watch it. It is so, so funny. It is. Yeah. Anyway. And the host is great. Yeah. And there's a Jacques who is a legit amazing pastry chef who's on every episode and yeah, they're just really sweet. And they always try to find something nice to say, but they're also laughing. <laughs> anyway, it's great. Okay. Well, with that, we are going to end our episode. I will say we are doing a book club chat on Instagram about On Earth for Briefly Gorgeous. If you would like to join, you can just message us at Unabridged Pod. We would love to have you join us and, and share your thoughts about the book. Thanks so much for listening. Do you have comments or opinions about what you heard today? We'd love to hear them. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Underbridge Pod or on the web at underbridgepod.com for a list of ways to support us. We'd like to thank Jared Featherstone, who composed our theme music, Strings of Light, and Katie Amy of Amy Photography, our podcast photographer. Thanks for listening to Unabridged. <laughs>